Welcome to Public Domain Video Theater presented by the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for another episode of Dragnet. The original air date is March the 4th, 1954. It's based on a radio play originally broadcast August the 16th, 1951. It's season three, episode 27, and the title is The Big Winchester. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Everybody starts out with the same chances. They grow up with the chance to play. The city provides playgrounds. Public schools give them a chance to learn. High schools, colleges. have an equal chance to obey the laws. Some of them don't take it. That's why I have a job. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, January 14th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. The teletype from the doctor at the police academy had been posted. My name was on the list. 8.30 a.m. I reported for my annual physical. Looks fine, Joe. I'm going to have to pass you. You mean I'm okay for another year, huh? Yeah. How about that shoulder? What? Gunshot wound. Ever bother you? No. When we took the x-rays, it looked like you were going to have trouble with it. Chip on? Mm-mm. You sure you'd never have any trouble with it? No. Well, once in a while in the wet weather, it kind of aches a little bit, you know. Yeah, that happens. How old are you, Joe? 33. Still central homicide? Mm-hmm. Serial number? 2288. 2288. Yeah, well, guess that does it. You'll get best. Okay, thanks. Keep me pretty busy, are they, Doc? 4,200 men. Keep you hopping. Hi, Doc. Sorry to bother you. You too, Joe? Yeah, anything doing? Dead body call out near Westlake Park. We got it? Yeah, but he got there. 932 Old Laurel Lane. What's the story? Old man found dead in his living room, bullet hole in his chest. Yeah? Boys in the radio car that answered the call thought the old man killed himself. And that's so sure now. What do you mean? I think somebody helped him. <laughs> a.m. We left the doctor's office at the police academy and we drove to the address in the Westlake area where the shooting had been reported. The dead man was identified as Martin Latimer, age 68, a retired owner of a couple of neighborhood grocery stores in the city. He was lying sprawled partly on his side on the floor. There was a bullet hole in his chest just above the heart where the slug had entered the body. There was another larger wound in the back through the right shoulder blade where the bullet had emerged. Approximately five feet from the body was a chair. There was a Winchester rifle wired firmly to the top, its muzzle pointing directly above the spot where the body lay on the floor. A thick white string was wound firmly around the trigger of the rifle. It ran through a metal ring on the stock of the gun and stretched across the room where it had been tied to the dead man's left index finger. At first glance, it seemed like an obvious suicide arrangement. Officer Harkness, one of the men in the radio car who answered the call, didn't agree. I don't know, Sergeant. Maybe I'm all wet. This doesn't gel right for me. Who found the body, Harkness? Next door neighbor, Mrs. Donworth. My partner's with her now. Did you fellas call the crime lab? Yeah, they're on their way. The old man the only one who lived in the house here? Yeah, that's what the neighbor told us. Sure would like to see what the crime lab crew's going to think of it. Why? What's the big question, Harkness? Well, I know it's none of my business, Sergeant. You fellas are the detectives. I just couldn't help but notice, though. Yeah, what's that? 
Over there, that rifle wire to the back of the chair? Yeah. Take a side along the barrel to see what you think. Yeah, pointed right in a straight line with the body. Well, that much fits. The old man pulled the string tied to his index finger. That set off the trigger and took the slug right through the chest. That's what I figured. Take a look at the wall directly behind the old man. The slug went clean through the body. We know that. Through the chest, above the heart, and then out through the shoulder blade. Yeah, I see what you mean. Take a look at that wall there. Not a mark on it. Well, one thing, sure, if the old man was shot in that position, the slug had to come this way. Went through his body at just about this height. We ought to find the bullet hole in this wall right along here. Man, there's not a trace of a slug any place. No. Not much chance it could have been deflected either, is there? That's what I thought at first, too, Sergeant. Yeah. Down by your right knee, on the wall. Take a look. Yeah, that looks like it. Well, there's something wrong here, Joe. That rifle never could have thrown a slug that far down on the wall. Wired to the chair the way it is. And yeah, besides, it's way out of line. Almost four feet here. I know it's none of my business, Sergeant. Couldn't help but notice it, though. You want me to stand by outside? Yeah, okay. And would you mind checking with a neighbor lady? What's her name? Mrs. Donward. Yeah, you said she lives right next door? Yeah, on this side. Would you mind telling her we'll be over here in a few minutes and ask her to wait? Right, we'll check with you before we leave. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll look at that gun again. It's a 30-30, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Sure doesn't add up too well, does it? Even if the old man jerked the gun when he pulled the trigger with that string arrangement there, the slug couldn't have passed through his chest, out his back, and then hit the wall where it did. Joe, stand right behind the body, will you? Let's see if we can line this thing up. No, a little more to the left. A little more. More like this? Yeah, that's it. Let me see. No, not a chance, Joe. It's way out of line. If this is the gun that killed the old man, he didn't pull the trigger. Not from there, anyway. There was one other chance, isn't there? Yeah. Somebody pulled it for him. <laughs> Sergeant J. Allen and a crew from the crime lab arrived and went to work. We put in a call to the coroner's office and asked them to remove the body. 9.15 a.m., we went next door to talk to the neighbor who had found the body, Mrs. Elsie Donworth. I went over to pick up his laundry, officer. I do laundry for half a dozen people here in the neighborhood. I don't charge any more than the regular laundries do. A lot more particular with shirts and things. I see, Miss Donworth. Would you go on, please? I went over about 8 o'clock this morning. I walked in and called out, but he didn't answer. Then I went into the parlor, and there he was. Poor old man looked so sad lying there, all alone, that big gun strapped to the chair. Gave him the coldest feeling. It was the same way when Claude died. Claude was my husband. I understand. Only Claude didn't shoot himself. Uh-huh. I take it you knew Mr. Latimer pretty well, ma'am? Oh, I suppose. He didn't have any relatives, poor man, all alone. He was in the grocery business for years. Made some nice money, I guess. He retired about eight years ago, sold both his stores... He had an income from a mortgage on one of them, $150 a month. Oh, yes, he was very comfortable. Uh-huh. He wasn't a penny pincher at all, but he was thrifty. It was the same way with my husband, Claude. He used to say, take care of the dimes, the dollars will take care of themselves. Miss Donworth, can you think of any reason why Latimer would want to take his own life? Oh, I suppose poor old man was getting along in years. He used to complain all the time about his health. For a long time there, he was afraid he was going to die with cancer. Is that so? Did Mr. Latimer have cancer, do you know? Oh, no, but he kept thinking he was going to die with it. Mr. Latimer was always talking about it. I'm going to check with Jay next door and see how they're making out. Tell them where we are. Right. I'll be right back. Mr. Latimer was so upset about it, he finally went to see a doctor. He came back and told me the doctor said for him not to be so silly about it. He was a well man and good health. That was last week only. When was the last time you saw Latimer, ma'am? Day before yesterday. Oh, we laughed and joked over the back fence. Poor old man had such a nice smile. Reminded me a good deal of my husband, Claude. I'd like to have your honest opinion here, Ms. Donworth. Do you think Latimer killed himself? Well, I suppose. That rifle in there, that terrible contraption. See you in a minute, Joe. Yeah. Excuse me, Ms. Donworth. Surely. Anything? The crime lab's having a field day, Joe. They say it'd be absolutely impossible for the old man to kill himself with that raid. Did they find anything definite? Dusted the rifle for fingerprints, didn't find a one. It makes less sense than that slug buried in the corner of the wall. Another thing. They checked the desk in the living room. Found some correspondence the Latimer had with the Lonely Hearts Club. Judging from the letter, seems Latimer was getting set to marry the girl. Big picture of her attached to the letter. Yeah, did you find out why he'd want to die? Pretty good reason why he'd want to live. Yeah. Beautiful girl, looks to be about 24, 25. Yeah. She was going to marry him. 
The crime lab crew went on with their routine investigation of the Martin Latimer house while Frank and I continued to talk to the neighbor, Mrs. Donworth. There didn't seem to be any common ground at all between the evidence in the house and the information she had to offer. As we continued questioning her, Mrs. Donworth remembered that a month before, Latimer had told her that something might happen to him and that he wanted to make out a will. He asked her to witness the will. A few days later, Latimer's lawyer came to the house and Mrs. Donworth read it and witnessed the signing. At that time, she said Latimer made the remark, I don't feel like going on much longer anyway. If death means arrest, I think I deserve one. Ma'am, did you hear anything out of the ordinary going on next door this morning or last night? No, there's nothing I heard from next door to remark about. Of course, it's so noisy around here that time of morning, you can't even hear yourself think. How's that, ma'am? The truck's passing by, up and down, up and down every morning. Not small trucks, either. They start in at 6 a.m. and they rattle past for two or three hours at least. Could you give us the names of some of the other people on the street who knew Mr. Latimer pretty well? Yes, I suppose. I don't think any of them knew the poor old man as well as I did. Most of them are younger folks, parties and things, you know. When you get up around 65 or past it, like Mr. Latimer, parties don't mean so much anymore. I understand. Yes, yeah, just a nice, quiet home with a good heating system, good books on the shelf, and a good man around the house. About all you can ask for. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Here's our card. If you think of anything else, please call us. All right. Frank Smith. That's you, huh? That's right. Homicide extension 2521. Just one more thing, Miss Donworth. We understand Latimer was corresponding with several women through a Lonely Hearts Club. Did he ever mention that to you by any chance? No, he never did. I saw the circulars and stuff around his house, though. And Latimer never mentioned any of the women that he corresponded with, huh? I pretended I didn't know about it. He never brought it up. I don't understand why he'd want to meet a lady that way. All most of them are looking for is a man with money so they can quit work and lay around the house. Well, thanks again, Miss Donworth. Yes, poor old man. I wonder what made him write letters after silly women. Well, good they'd have done him. He wrote letters all over the country. Yes, ma'am. I'm getting tired of working myself. He could have saved the postage, too. Ma'am? I was right next door. I would have married him in a minute. Mrs. Donworth's house and we went back next door to Latimer's house. The crime lab crew had finished their investigation and the coroner's deputies had arrived. They took the body downtown for autopsy. We talked over the crime lab findings with Sergeant Jay Allen and he felt the same way Frank and I did. The theory that Latimer had shot himself to death was possible in many respects, but it was far from plausible. We checked through Latimer's correspondence with the women he contacted by mail, especially the young girl he obviously intended to marry, judging from his letters to her. Her picture showed her to be brunette, dark eyes, young, very attractive. The inscription read, with love, Catherine. There was no return address either on the photo or on any of the letters. 9.52 a.m., we put in a call to the mail club. Yes, ma'am, we may drop down to talk to you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. What'd they have to say? Well, it might be, Joe. Club secretary says they've been having trouble with somebody who signs a picture just like this one, with love, Catherine. I described the picture. Secretary says it's the same girl. What's the angle? Well, the girl doesn't belong to the club, but somehow she got a list of the members and their addresses. She writes to them, usually old men, gets them set for marriage, and they send for her. Yeah. Her letters come from the east, usually different cities. She writes and asks for train fare out here. The men send her the money for clothes and train fare, and that's the last of it. She's gone. Well, that's adds up all right, doesn't it? There's one letter here. This one. I hate to ask you, dear, but if you could send me the traveling money and just a little extra for some clothes, I will take the first train and be with you in a week to become your wife, awaiting that precious moment with love. Kind of pours it on thick, huh? What's the date on that one? Let's see. Mail December 30th. That's 14 days ago. What do you think, Joe? I don't know. It's possible. She could have showed up, tried to grab all the old man's money she could find. Maybe he caught her at it. She killed him, rigged up this phony setup to make it look like Latimer shot himself. Get it hold more water if we could find out she really came here. Maybe we'd better start ringing a few doorbells. The other neighbors might come up with something. What do you say? Let's take another look at that girl's picture, huh? Here you are. No photographer's name. Underneath here, down the corner of the mounting, see? XXX6Y3. Must be some kind of manufacturer's mark. Photographic supply, huh? Mm-hmm. Guess it stands for the type of mounting, huh? You know anything about the photo business? No. I don't either. Well, let's find somebody who does. The 
Before we drove back to the office, Frank and I covered the rest of the neighborhood and talked to everybody who knew the dead man, Martin Latimer, even remotely. They told us nothing we didn't already know. There had been no stranger seen visiting the old man. No one had noticed anything out of the ordinary in Latimer's daily routine. Three o'clock that afternoon, we checked with a photo supply firm where we found out that the symbols stamped on the cardboard frame of the photograph signed Catherine were symbols used by a photo supply company in San Francisco. We went back to the office and got in touch with the San Francisco firm. We were told that the symbols indicated the style and size of photographic mountings, and further, that this particular type of mounting was distributed only throughout seven western states. They gave us a list of 18 photo studios in Los Angeles who kept this particular mount in stock. It was a long chance, but we started checking them out. Meantime, we'd run the girl through R&I &I and gotten out an APB seeking information on her. Monday, January 19th, I checked into the office. Homicide, Friday. Oh, hi, Faye. No, no, he's not right now. I expect him in almost any minute. Yeah, mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. Wait till I get a pencil. Okay. Three pounds of ground round. Yeah. Lean, yeah. No, I'll tell him. Oh, loaf of rye bread. Uh-huh. With what? Oh, seeds. With seeds. Yeah, okay. And a quart of cream. Oh. oh, ice cream. Yeah. No, I don't know what anybody wants with a quart of cream in. Yeah. What kind? Chocolate. Okay. Uh huh. That's it, huh? Right. Sure, I'll be happy to. Oh, pretty good, Faye. And the kids? Fine. Well, we've been pretty busy lately, you know. Uh -huh. Sure, I'll try to make it next week. Right. Bye. Oh, Faye. She hung up. Oh. Your wife. Oh, what you want? Some stuff she wants you to bring home tonight. Yeah? Seeds? Yeah, for rye bread, you know. Well, why don't you write it down, Joe? R.B. Seeds doesn't mean anything. How'd you do it? Well, I covered seven photographic studios on the 8th. I got lucky. Yeah. Doris Chambers, age 22. January 19th, 10.30 a.m. The proprietor of the photo studio on Melrose Avenue had identified the girl in the picture. He told us she was Doris Chambers, age 22. She came from a fairly well-to-do family and her father was manager of a local neighborhood bank. We drove over to talk to her. She couldn't recognize the handwriting on the photo, nor did she understand the inscription with love, Catherine. After questioning her, it became apparent she knew nothing at all about 68-year-old Martin Latimer. I wonder if you'd mind taking another look at the handwriting on that picture, miss. Take a close look. Is it familiar at all to you? No. No, I couldn't be sure either way. Seems like I've seen it, though. When did you say you had that picture made? About a year ago at graduation. My mother had extra copies made up. She liked it. I didn't care for it much. Could you tell us how many people have prints of this picture? Mama had about two dozen copies made up. She took 12 and I took 12. She sent them to relatives and friends of ours. She kept a few. What'd you do with yours? Sent them to friends, girls at school, a few of my boyfriends. And can you remember if you autographed any of them? Yes, yeah, some of them. The one for my girlfriends. The others I gave out plain. Can you try and think who you gave those to, miss? The unsigned pictures? One went to Carl. I know that. And then Fred and Don and Ray and Warren... Yeah, I think that's it. I wonder if we could have their full names and addresses, please. Yes. All right. I'm pretty sure I've got them in here someplace. I don't know what I'm saving all this junk for. Old letters and... Just a minute. That's funny. It's the same handwriting, isn't it? I thought I'd seen it before. Ma'am? This old letter from Warren. See the writing? Doesn't that look the same to you? Looks close, Joe. Yeah, we'll have Don Meyer in handwriting check it over. Who is this Warren, Miss Chambers? Warren White. Here's his address right here. I got it, Joe. Warren and I went to college together. We were engaged to be married for a while. Then I broke it off. Oh, I see. Warren's a serious boy. He's very thorough. A perfectionist, you know, Sergeant? Never does things halfway. Is that so? I've never known Warren to do anything in his life halfway. Not once. Well, he's going to have a perfect record if that handwriting matches, isn't he? What can they do to him? I don't know, but they won't do it halfway. <laughs> Eleven 
11.02 a.m., we left the home of Doris Chambers and drove down Beverly Boulevard to 743 North Clarewood Avenue, an apartment house where the suspect was supposed to be living. We talked to the manager, and he told us that Warren White had moved without giving notice five days before on January 14th. The same day, 68-year-old Martin Latimer was found dead in his home. We got on the phone, talked to Doris Chambers again, and she gave us a lead on Warren White's married sister. The following day, we located the sister of the murder suspect, and she told us that her brother Warren had phoned that morning and asked for an emergency loan of $200, which he didn't have. The sister gave us White's new address, and we checked it out. We had the manager let us in White's apartment. It was one of those run-down, futuristic-style apartment houses built somewhere around the mid-30s. It was on a high, narrow road above Sunset Boulevard, overlooking most of Hollywood. White wasn't in, and the manager said he wasn't expected back until early next morning. We waited. Midnight. 1 a.m. No sign of the suspect. You know, Joe, you can't beat it. The view from up here is beautiful. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? You ought to look around and find a place like this for yourself. Be great. Well, the rent's too high up here. Well, it's the location, I guess. You know, people love hillsides, love to be high. The higher you are, the more it costs. Of course, the location is great. Public school right down there. And if you take Sunset Boulevard down to the freeway, you're in the city hall in 10 minutes. It doesn't take me much longer. Right? About 20 minutes is all. Yeah, but you don't have the view, Joe. I don't smell that air. What time you got? 1.45. We waited. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 4.30. It was cold. Still no sign of the suspect, Warren White. 5 a.m., 5.30. 6.30, 7 a.m., 7.30. We kept waiting. No sign of the suspect. We called the office and arranged for a relief. 8 a.m., we could hear groups of youngsters passing by outside, trooping into the main yard of a school just below the apartment house. We kept waiting. 8.15 a.m. Come on in. What is this? What do you want? You Warren White? Yeah. Stand still. He's clean, Joe. Well, what do you want? Police officers. You been drinking? Yeah, a little. But it's all right. Why don't you sit down, officers? I'm not going to give you any trouble. What do you mean? I killed him. Maybe I'll never know why, but I killed him. Sit down, officers. Some bourbon in the kitchen. You want some? No, thanks. Why'd you kill the old man, son? You want to tell us? I don't know. Probably a hundred reasons. Not sure of any one of them. Something I never realized before. Yeah? I mean, killing a man, taking a human life. I guess nobody knows what it is till they do it. Most complicated thing in the world. You must have had a reason for it, killing him, rigging it for a suicide. Do you have anything against him? I hardly even knew him. I used that picture of Doris to fool him. Made some good money doing it. I needed it. You willing to give us a statement about the whole thing? I haven't anything to hide, officer. The minute I killed him, I knew it was over. Right there in that one minute. I knew you'd come and find me somehow. I didn't know when, but I knew you'd come and find me. All right. We better head downtown. Yeah. That's a great sound, isn't it? What's that? Schoolyard, the kids. Got a great sound to it. Good one. Yeah. Could I please go over there for a minute? All right. All right. How can anybody figure it? You start in the schoolyard, like those kids down there, running around, yelling. I started the same. Yeah. I wonder what it is that happens. An eight-year-old red-headed kid. Must be one down there now. Other kids will grow up, get jobs, work and die. It'll be all right. Yeah. One kid will end up in an alley with a gun in his hand. How can anybody figure it? I wouldn't know. A bunch of kids playing in a schoolyard. Someday one of them's a killer. Yeah. You tell me. What's the answer?
on April 8th, trial was held in Department 88, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. Welcome back. Well, during the conversation with the police doctor at the start of the episode, there was uh, some people I saw on a forum online speculating about when Joe Friday was supposed to have been shot. Well, the only episode I'm aware of where Friday was shot prior to this was on the radio. It was called The Big Ben, where uh, Friday was shot and then his partner, Ben Romero, took over narration. Now, on television, it happened in reverse with uh, Frank Smith being shot. So it didn't happen on TV. I guess it's important to keep in mind that Dragnet is not what you'd call a heavy continuity show when it comes to uh, its characters. The Dragnet TV show is known for featuring a lot of the old radio actors. Herb Bygren, Virginia Gregg, Ralph Moody, and many of these actors multiple times. However, you will also get to see some actors who went on to stardom in other series, like when we saw Leonard Nimoy in The Big Boys, and uh, when we saw Ellen Corby in The Big Ham. And here we get another treat with a cameo by Fess Parker as a uh, police officer who discovered the body. And of course, Parker would go on to stardom with the role of Davy Crockett for The Wonderful World of Disney. I loved Friday's line regarding uh, the killer, who the ex-fiancé said he never did anything halfway. And when she asked what would happen to him, uh, Friday's response I don't know, but they're not going to do it halfway was really funny. I don't know how realistic it is, but it was just a really good line. The ending of this episode is really good. It's kind of like a sort of uh, film noir sort of ending as the killer is dealing with how he has gone wrong and destroyed his life. And taking this horrific turn, it's a really good, solid, quiet moment. It's one of those cases in older films where the little, just a little bit of silence gives a bit of weight to the proceeding. So overall, I thought this was a really good episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. That's all for now. Join us back here next time for another episode of Public Domain Video Theater. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And if you like these videos, you can become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.